Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for your church. It's a breath of fresh air to be here in Kaikohe with all of you. And I understand that some of you have come from different places. God is so good. And he is doing great things for all of us. We talked this morning in Sabbath school about personal testimony. How is your personal testimony about Jesus? I have a testimony about Jesus. And sometimes I've wondered whether I could share that testimony or speak that testimony. And I've doubted it. If you're here today and you have some doubts about what Jesus can do for you, hang on, because he's going to do it and you're going to experience it. Well, I want to particularly, first of all, acknowledge your pastor, Gary Holman, and his wife, Mariana, who have served faithfully here for a number of years. I mean, it's not up to me, but I just want to say on behalf of the North New Zealand Conference, a big thank you for the service you've given so humbly and so faithfully. And uh, I know that you have been a blessing. God has used you to bless the people of this uh, church, of this community. And may God continue to do that. May God continue not to use you, Gary and Mariana, but not only you, the, all, all of us, all of you, who are part of this place, to lift up his name to show Jesus in this community. Lord, as we are gathered here in this special Sabbath to remember, to celebrate, to worship you, we pray that you would be here and that you would bless us, strengthen us, refresh us, Guide our thoughts, lead our lives, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The church has one foundation. Tis Jesus Christ, her Lord. From heaven he came and sought her. With his own blood he bought her. And for her life he died. Where were you in 1970? I was a foundation student at a brand new school in Wellington, Titahi Bay Intermediate. What was happening in 1970? Well, Pastor Doug, Rhodesia cut the ties with Great Britain, declared itself a racially segregated republic. It was on March 1. 1970. Tonga on June the 4th and Fiji October the 10th yesterday also declared or gained their independence from Britain as well. There was a massive earthquake in Peru which killed over 50,000 people. The Beatles broke up. Who are the Beatles? The National Party was in its second term of government and the Prime Minister was uh, Sir Keith Holyoke, the leader of the opposition, Norman Kirk. New Zealand won two gold, 
six silver and two bronze at the Commonwealth Games in Scotland that year. The world's population was 3 billion, 700 million, 437,000 or thereabouts. The Seventh-day Adventist Church membership in 1970 was 1,612,136. In 1970, there was one Seventh-day Adventist for every 229 people in the world. In 2020, the world's population is 7 billion, 794 million, 798,000 or thereabouts. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church membership this year, it's the latest sort of count is 21,556,637. And in 2020, there's one Seventh-day Adventist for every 361 people. Is God going to finish the work? He is. Because believe it or not, it's not just us who are preaching the gospel. And God can do great things. In 1970, uh, the uh, New Zealand population was... Let me see. Let me get this right. I don't have the, actually the 1970 figures for today, but the North Island population right now today is around 3.8 million people. And in our conference, our membership today is 11,254. And there's one Seventh-day Adventist, when you do the, do the sums, one Seventh-day Adventist for every 337 people in New Zealand. Our world is so different, isn't it? It's so different from that of 1970. If any of you were here in 1970, at the opening of this building, did you think one day in the future you would be experiencing a world pandemic that has killed over half a million people, that has infected millions over a million more, or millions more, that has shut so many borders, caused massive job losses, closed down, well, almost closed down economies in such a major way? What has changed between 1970 and 2020? So much has changed, hasn't it? So much has changed. Perhaps we have changed. I have changed. In 1970, I never dreamed I would be a pastor, let alone be here in Kaikohe today. We live in a changing world. And you know, even the rate of change is changing. It's getting faster and faster. Rapid change is normal. 90% of the data that we have in the world today was generated in the last how many years? Two years. 90%. How long is our history? We conduct more than half of our web searches from a mobile phone today. Never heard of mobile phone, phones in 1970. More than 3.7 billion humans use the internet. And on average, Google now processes more than 40,000 searches every second. That's 3.5 billion searches a day. And if you take all the searches that are happening, it's over 5 billion searches a day on the internet. And so many of us love social media. Every minute, Snapchat users share 527,760 photos. Every minute. 120 professionals join LinkedIn 
every minute. Users watch 4,146,600 YouTube videos every minute. 456,000 tweets are, set, are sent on Twitter every minute. And Instagram users post 46,740 photos every minute. With all this change, where are our anchor points? You know, some things have not changed. The effect of sin and evil has not changed, except that it seems to be getting so much more, more and more all the time. Something else hasn't changed. God's word hasn't changed. And along with it, the author of this word has not changed. And so most importantly for us, what has not changed is the bridge, is the door, is the gate, himself, creator, redeemer, saviour, sustainer. Only one name under heaven, Acts chapter 4 verse 12, we read this morning. Only one name under heaven, whereby we must be saved, given among men, and it's the name of Jesus, our cornerstone of our foundation. And I want to salute you again, Kaikohe Church, for your faithfulness, for your willingness, and your efforts to be the people of God in this community. Praise God. The last time we came here, I think it was, I think it was June last year. The door was locked. <laughs> we got here just in time for Sabbath school. So we head up to Kaitaia because that's where everyone was. And we made it for church. But I remember the time previous to that when I was here, a number of years ago. And there's just one or two faces I can still remember from way back then. I mean, so many of you were here, have been here for so much. But it's so good to see some of your faces again. That you're still here. That you're still serving God. And I asked Pastor Gary for, you know, to tell me a little bit about your, your mission and your vision. And he said, he talked about the mission saying, a caring, Bible-based, community-focused church. And it's wonderful to hear the news, you know, of what you are doing in the community. I hope that you can continue doing that more and more. And the mission to be, to bring people in Kaikohe into a relationship with Jesus Christ in the context of Bible prophecy. Well, someone may correct me. Kaikohe's population in 2020, according to statistics, New Zealand is 4,446. Does that sound right? I know Kaikohe's a town and probably serves a greater rural community, but that's the figures I have. Um, when I looked at the Kaikohe church membership, at the start of 2020, it was 97. And I looked at the Kaikohe average attendance in 2019, it was uh, 45, Gary, average attendance. And so by attendance, if we, if we uh, take that, there's one Seventh-day Adventist for every 98 people in Kaikohe. That's much better than our national average, isn't it? So praise God for that. May it get even better. 1942, 1970, now 2020, some milestones in the journey of this church community, of the families, the saints who have been part of this body of faith. So many great things have happened in your history and it's just gonna be amazing to hear the, some of those stories this afternoon. Be great to hear the stories of Kaikohe Church. But let me mention the greatest story of God's church. By the grace God has given me, 
I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus loves his church. He died for his church. Yes, he died for the church. And yet it's really important for us to not forget that Jesus didn't only die for the church. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. The world. And this is the story of God's kingdom. Because the church must be the greatest shining example of God's kingdom. Because God's kingdom is not just simply the church as we so often think of it. God's kingdom is bigger. God's kingdom is everywhere. Jesus has inaugurated God's kingdom. God is at work everywhere in different places. His spirit is striving. And our message to the world as we've sung, one Lord, one faith, one birth. Don't get me wrong. But when we speak the truth, the truth we represent is not simply our doctrines, the things we believe about sin and the great conflict. It's about what every person out there in the Kaikohe community, about us as the people of God in this community, are in Christ. Because God so loved the world that Jesus came. And the Bible talks about this in so many places. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. As we read through some of these verses. And there he talks about God's chosen and God's and the Gentiles. And he talks about what has happened through Jesus Christ. And in verse 13 it says, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. How do you see the world out there? Verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow chosen or fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building. And the church is just not this stone and mortar and timber. The church is you. The church is us. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. The foundation is nothing but in Christ as the cornerstone our anchor, our anchor points. So and to our friends here, to our workmates, wherever they might be, to our schoolmates, our family, our neighbours, is that Jesus so loved you. He's done everything necessary for you to have the abundant life and to have it eternally, to inherit that eternal life, to reach your full potential as one who's been created in his image. 
Because what do you have without God? What do you have without God? And I've often thought about that. Maybe some of us are lucky we could have great wealth. Perhaps there are even some of us here who are just so happy about the relationships that you have, your family, the people that you love, everything's going really well. Often it doesn't. But what happens if you survive accident or illness or coronavirus and you reach your three score years, even 10 or a bit more? Then what? The wages of sin is death. So come build your life on the foundation, Jesus Christ. Get away from the shifting sand and establish your house, your home, your life, your future on the rock, Jesus Christ. Why? Because life is precious. Life is a gift that God gave us. It's a promise from God of joy, of peace, of power, of eternity with him. Life without Jesus is hopeless. Well, it's important for the church in 2020, in the rapidly changing world, the church also needs to change. Oh, the church also needs to change to be effective in this world, in this community. It's imperative for the church to be adapting. You know, I'm listening to these messages from, from the, uh, the researchers, the church students who are looking at the effects of what's happened through this lockdown and through this pandemic that's still raging around the world. And they're all saying it. The church is different. The context is different. The world is different. Somehow we have to change. Somehow we need to not be afraid of change, not be afraid that the gospel is going to change. No. God is going to change. No. Jesus is going to change. No. But that somehow we, in the power of his Holy Spirit, are able to change and be effective. The mission. So for us, you know, the essence must be Jesus. The church has one foundation. His gospel, his love, his presence. His presence here in this community. The people of God as the dwelling place of God. He's building us to be this holy temple. The house of God built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles and that primary cornerstone of the foundation, Jesus Christ. The person of God himself. The message of Ephesians chapter 2 is a reminder to us. It's focusing us on the vital, the most important, the essential. And it reminds us that we were excluded, but now we're included. That we were dead in our sins. But now we are miraculously, radically raised to life in Christ. And so, and so in Christ, we are being changed into his likeness. We are being renewed in the image of God. So what does this all mean for us, you know? I have to say, I... You know, life is one big learning experience. I hope you can see that and understand that. God is teaching us all the time what he's trying to. It means peace. Peace with God. It's knowing that God loves you and he proved it in the coming of Jesus Christ. It means assurance. It means mission. 
to the people of the kingdom. All those Jesus came to die for. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to Christ and come to repentance and come to life, the abundant life. Remember the church. The church is you. The church is me. So who are you? Who am I? I love this message by Sister Teresa. Christ has no body on earth but yours. No hands but yours. No feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he is to look out. Christ's compassion to the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless. Our conference vision is to see God's kingdom grow in North New Zealand through servant disciples living out the presence of Jesus. This salvation, this relationship with Jesus blesses us, but it's also to bless others. The needs out there are so many, but I'm no evangelist. What can I do? What can I do? Well, let me just talk about, oh, just one of the needs out there. Did you know that loneliness is another growing pandemic in the world? Dr. Julian Holt, for example, Julian Holt Hollandstad um, did some studies, I mean, amongst many others, but her study I'm just referring to. And she examined the extent to which social relationships and other social indicators, such as the size of the social network, the perceived social support, that influ uh, how they influence one's risk of mortality. And it included 300,000 participants around the world found out that scoring low on these indicators of social connection carried a similar risk to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. So you kick the smoking habit. Lonely, some of the very lonely people are like in a very unhealthy track. Participants with stronger relationships were, but were found to have a 50% increased likelihood of survival. And then she did another, another study which involved 3.4 million participants and focused on the subjective loneliness and actual physical social isolation and found that both can lead to a 30% increased risk of premature death. And she said that this particular risk exceeds that of obesity of physical and inactivity, of pollution in the air. It's a significant factor in depression, heart disease, inflammation. You know, the older you get, the more you, your joints get inflamed. And much more. And all of this contributes to a shorter lifespan. How do we see these people? Do we know any of these people? They're everywhere in Kaikoi. All of these people, all people have an inner distinctive feature. Do you know what it is? It includes us, you know. That inner distinctive feature is that God created them, male and female, in his image. The destroyer has defaced that, but essentially, it's still God's design. 
as we were travelling up yesterday, Nolene has been in Wellington all of the past week visiting her, her whanau down there. And as we were driving up, she was telling me about her sister's church. Not an Adventist church, Pentecostal type of a church. Uh, the pastor of the church, uh, they, it's in Porirua. Um, the church, he, his house is next to the church. The church has got a big car park. And just at the front, in front of his place, um, they're neighbours to a mongrel mob address. And some nights, the noise, the parties, the language, even the fighting at times, would get so bad he'd have to gather his, his family and say, let's get out of here. Just to get away from that environment, you know, because it was pretty rough. Well, one night the party was raging, the language was raging. So he said to his kids, come on, let's go. So they got in their car and they went down and they visited like close to midnight. So they went to they went to buy food, and the only places mainly that were open were the petrol stations. And I can imagine, because I come from, you know, I lived in Porirua for a lot of my life. And they went and they bought all the hot food they could from those petrol stations. Maybe three or four of them. And they came back to their neighbor's address. And he said, follow me. And they carried the food and they walked in. They greeted their neighbours. They said, oh, we thought you could do with some, some kai, you know, some food. And the head mobster was, you know, I mean, he knew that he would, he knew it was the pastor, the neighbours, and he was very grateful. And um, so they dished out the food and went home. Very shortly after the music died down, very quiet, no more noise. The night was peaceful. And I thought to myself, you know, how do those people encounter God? And there were a number of other stories, but I don't have time to tell, you know, some of those other stories. Do you know, the Saviour mingled with men as one who desired their good. He had sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs. We hear it so many times. I'm not, I'm not good at it. I need to get better at it. I've made some connections with my neighbours, but I need to do a lot more. We need to be Christ, to be in Christ, should I say, so that we can be as Christ. The image of God. Everyone that we see, if you're looking through the eyes of Christ into the world, everyone we see carries the image of God. Every one of them, every one of us, marred by sin, scarred by evil, we're all products of God's creation. <clears throat> this is who Jesus saw in every person when he walked the streets of Palestine, the tracks around Galilee. This is what he sees today. Like us, he sees Asians. He sees religious sectarianism. He sees eunuchs. He sees Ethiopians. He sees the wealthy. He sees the poor masses. He sees the LGBT. He sees the criminals, the pillars of society, racism. He sees the sanctified. He sees the murderers. He sees the pastors. He sees the Samoans, the counselors, the sanctimonious, the nurses, the crippled, the pedophiles, the orphans, the widows, the Maori, Catholics, women, the athletes, the rappers. Adventists, Croatians, atheists, George Floyd, David Clark, Black Power, Shane Jones, Ben Timothy. 
you. God so loved that Jesus came. That whosoever believes in him, that whosoever sees him and comes to know him and receives him will not perish, but will be fully restored into the wholeness of his image, the image of God, and have the abundant life, life to the max. Jesus said in Luke 10, the harvest is plentiful. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. See, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Whatever house you enter, first say peace. Can we not see like Jesus beyond the categories, beyond the labels, beyond the titles to see God's people who belong in his kingdom? Can we see like Jesus? What God is doing out there around us? Can we be like Jesus? Can we be the presence of Jesus everywhere you are, everywhere you go? The hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus. We're living in a world of rapid change. But the greatest change this world has ever known is still the same. It was Jesus coming to planet Earth and showing us who God is. And he's coming back. He's coming back. We need to change as a church. Do you see what I mean? Too often we've got this category of that kind of has a filter on our church doors. But we need to be like Jesus in the world to do his mission because we are Jesus in the world. To see God's kingdom grow in North New Zealand through servant disciples being or living out the presence of Jesus. Amen.